The first is called Bruton's A-gamma globulinemia. It begins with a B, Bruton's, and because of that, it's easy to remember boys, which also starts with B. And that's important because this is an X-linked condition, meaning that boys are going to be much more likely to carry this disease than our women. So one other important thing to know about Bruton's A-gamma globulinemia is the genetic defect that's involved. And typically, it's a defect in BTK, which is a tyrosine kinase gene. And when this gene is mutated, unfortunately, these patients experience a blockage in the differentiation of their B cells. And without this certain step in the differentiation of the B cell, the B cell is unable to mature. And as a result, you get a decreased number of normal active B cells. And you also get decreased production of all classes of immunoglobulins. If the B cells are not able to develop from immature B cells into mature B cells, of course, there are not going to be as many circulating mature B cells in the bloodstream. And there's also not going to be as much immunoglobulin being produced because these immature B cells are unable to produce normal immunoglobulin. As a result, these patients are going to get recurrent bacterial infections, and in particular, you're going to see these infections after about six months of age. So why six months of age? The answer is that that is when most of the maternal IgG antibody has run out in the baby's system. So as you know, IgG is the antibody that gets transferred across the placenta. So for the first six months of life, the baby is afforded protective immunity because of the mother's IgG that has crossed the placenta. However, at around six months, most of that IgG has already sort of disintegrated or has come out of the baby's system. And as a result, they no longer have the mother's protective immunity. And now because they have this A-gamma globulinemia, they're unable to fight infection. The next one is called hyper-IgM syndrome. And this one's pretty easy because as the name implies, these patients have way too much IgM. Now what comes with that? Of course, it's gonna be some sort of a defect. And the defect here is that although there's a lot of IgM around, they are unable to class switch and produce other types of antibodies. So what's going on here is that these patients have a defective CD40 ligand. And CD40 ligand is a cell surface marker seen on helper T cells. And this cell surface marker, CD40L, is critically important for the ability to cause class switching in B cells. So if you're missing the CD40 ligand, you're unable to do efficient class switching. And all this IgN that gets produced sticks around but the B cells are never able to class switch to produce IgA, IgG, or IgE. And as a result, those three antibodies are extremely low in a patient with hyper-IgM syndrome. As you might expect, they're going to present with severe pyogenic infections very early in life. Next, we have selective immunoglobulin deficiency. And this one, again, the name tells you a lot. What's going on here is that you're going to have a select immunoglobulin, so only one class, that's actually low, while all the others are normal. So this could be an IgA deficiency, which is the most common. It could be an IgM deficiency, or it could be an IgG deficiency, etc. Now, as I said, IgA deficiency is the most common. That's the one you should know about for step one. Patients with IgA deficiency tend to develop a lot of gastrointestinal infections and diarrhea. This should also make sense to you because you know that IgA is the predominant antibody secreted at mucosal surfaces. So if the decrease in IgA in the mucosa of the gut, you're going to be more susceptible to GI infections. And one commonly tested example on step one would be Giardia parasitic infections. In addition, these patients with IgA deficiency are especially prone to milk allergies. They're also especially prone to developing an anaphylactic reaction to blood transfusions. Next, we have CVID, or Common Variable Immunodeficiency. This one is special because unlike all the others that we're talking about, this one can actually present in the 20s to 30s. So this is more of an acquired immunodeficiency. So you may have a young adult who has gone their whole life with a normal immune system. And then finally, this Common Variable Immunodeficiency develops in the 20s or 30s. And what's going on here is that it's an acquired defect in B cell maturation. So you can sort of think about it as Bruton's A-gamma globulinemia, but it's an acquired form as opposed to an inherited form. And there are many, many causes of this. It's different types of mutations, each of which can lead 
to a defect in B-cell maturation. And you do not need to know the specific mutations for step one. Just understand that this can present much later in life than most of these other immunodeficiencies. So these patients have an increased risk of certain infections, in particular sinopulmonary infections. They also have an increased risk of autoimmune disease as well as lymphoma because of their faulty immune systems. In a laboratory setting, these patients are going to have a normal number of B cells. They're going to have a decrease in plasma cells. And with that decrease in plasma cells, you're going to see a decrease in the number of immunoglobulins produced of all classes. So again, very, very similar to Bruton's agammaglobulinemia. Next, we have thymic aplasia, also known as DeGeorge syndrome. And this is caused by a 22Q11 deletion. So on the 22nd chromosome, there's going to be a deletion that causes failure of the third and fourth pharyngeal pouches to develop. Unfortunately, patients who have failure of the third and fourth pharyngeal pouches to develop are going to present with a number of deficiencies that are a result of structures that are unable to form without these pouches. So for example, the third and fourth pharyngeal pouch are necessary for development of the thymus. So these patients are going to have an aplastic thymus or an underdeveloped thymus. And with that, they're going to have basically a huge T-cell deficiency. So as you might expect, they're going to present with a lot of recurrent viral and fungal infections. In addition, the third and fourth pharyngeal pouches are necessary for development of the parathyroid gland. So these patients develop hypoparathyroidism, they get low parathyroid hormone, and they become hypocalcemic. And lastly, these patients also will come up with congenital heart and great vessel defects. Again, as a result of maldevelopment of the third and fourth pharyngeal pouches. One way this is commonly tested on step one is that you'll have a baby who undergoes a chest x-ray and there's an absence of a thymic shadow. And normally, an infant will have a very large thymic shadow seen on a chest x-ray, but in a patient with DeGeorge syndrome, there will be no thymic shadow. Next, we have IL-12 receptor deficiency. And IL-12 receptor deficiency is going to be really important because IL-12 is a cytokine that's critically important for activating type 1 helper T cells. Now, IL-12 usually gets secreted by macrophages, and when it gets secreted, it activates type 1 helper T cells. So without these type 1 helper T cells being activated, you're also going to get a decrease in the amount of interferon gamma being released. Because if you remember, interferon gamma gets released by type 1 helper T cells, which in turn activates macrophages. So in these patients, you have both an inability of macrophages to activate helper T cells and also an inability of helper T cells to activate macrophages. Both situations are going to result in an increased susceptibility to disseminated mycobacterial infections. These may include tuberculosis as well as the atypical mycobacterium, such as MAC or mycobacterium avium complex. Next, we have hyper-IgE syndrome. And as the name implies, these patients are going to have very high levels of IgE. And what do you think might come along with high levels of IgE? You're right, allergies and eczema. These patients will get allergies and eczema as a result of high levels of IgE. However, in addition, they have a number of other clinical manifestations that are all really a result of the helper T cell being unable to produce large amounts of interferon gamma. And if the T cell is unable to produce interferon gamma, as we just discussed, that's going to affect its ability to stimulate other cells in the immune system. So in particular, in hyper-IgE syndrome, you're going to have an inability of neutrophils to respond to chemotactic stimuli. The main way that a neutrophil knows to go to a site of infection is because the helper T cells have released a large amount of interferon gamma. And an inability to do that in hyper-IgE syndrome is going to cause a number of clinical manifestations we already talked about the high levels of IgE causing allergies and eczema. These patients will also have coarse facies, okay, so certain abnormal facial structures. They're going to have cold abscesses, usually caused by staph aureus, and they're going to have retained primary teeth. So as most babies are going to lose their primary teeth as they get into toddlerhood, these patients actually retain their primary teeth. And of note, hyper-IgE syndrome is also sometimes referred to as Jobs syndrome. Next, we have chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis. And as the name implies, this is a candidal or yeast infection found in many parts of the body, 
all over the skin as well as mucosal surfaces. And this is actually caused by certain causes of T-cell dysfunction, which you do not really have to know for step one. But you should know that Candida albicans is going to be the primary fungus, yeast, responsible for this infection. And then it's going to be disseminated throughout the body, in particular the skin and mucous membranes. Next, we have severe combined immunodeficiency, or SCID, and there are several types of SCID. The bottom line is that each one, although it may have different causes, is going to result in a severe deficiency of all immune function in these patients. And as a result, they're going to present with recurrent viral, bacterial, fungal, and protozoal infections. And it's because they're going to have a decrease in both T cells and B cells, as well as an inability of T cells and B cells to respond well to infection. So you can think of this disease as a global decrease in immune function. So what are the causes? One common cause is going to be a defective IL-2 receptor. All right, now you should think back to a prior lecture, and you'll remember that IL-2 is made from type 1 helper T cells, and it activates the type 2 helper T cells, and it also activates the CD8 cytotoxic T cells. So in effect, IL-2 is an extremely important cytokine. It gets released from helper T cells to basically activate all other types of T cells. You can imagine without this being around, you're going to be in trouble. This is the most common form of SCID, and it's an X-linked disorder when this is a mutation involved. There are a couple other causes. One would be an adenosine deaminase deficiency. Why does that cause SCID? Because adenosine deaminase is something that actually inactivates adenosine. And adenosine, when it's not in high levels, is going to cause toxicity to both B cells and T cells. And lastly, we have a failure to synthesize MHC type 2 molecules. Now, as you know, the MHC type 2 molecule is critically important for antigen presenting cells to present their antigens to T cells so that the immune response can happen. So a failure to synthesize MHC2 molecules will result in SCID. Next, we have ataxia telangiectasia. Ataxia telangiectasia, as the name implies, is going to cause ataxia, so cerebellar defects. It's going to cause telangiectasias, which are small spider angiomas that can be found throughout the skin. And this disease also is going to cause an immunodeficiency, and in particular, an IgA deficiency. So we already talked about a selective IgA deficiency as one type of immune disease. This is another one that also causes an IgA deficiency. Only in this situation, it's a defect in DNA repair enzymes that is the cause, and it's also associated with cerebellar defects as well as telangiectasias. Then we have Wiscott-Aldridge syndrome. And Wiscott-Aldridge syndrome is an X-linked recessive defect, and it basically results in a progressive deletion of both B cells and T cells. Now, this sounds very similar to a lot of the other ones you've already gone over. So how do you remember this one? Well, Wiscott-Aldridge has a famous triad, which is pretty easy to remember. And the triad consists of thrombocytopenia, infections, and eczema. So if you have a patient on step one who presents with thrombocytopenia, infections, and eczema, you want to think about Wiscott-Aldridge syndrome. These patients have high levels of both IgE and IgA. The IgE explains the eczema. And they're going to have low levels of IgM. And if you can't mount an IgM response, as you already know, that's going to make you extremely susceptible to encapsulated bacteria, such as strep pneumo, Neisseria meningitidis, or H. flu. Next, we have leukocyte adhesion deficiency, and leukocyte adhesion deficiency, as the name implies, is going to be when a leukocyte is unable to extravasate or to come out of the blood vessel into the tissues. So as a result, if there's a local infection in a tissue, there's going to be a very low number of neutrophils present in that site of infection, and as a result, you're going to get recurrent bacterial infections, going to have no pus formation, because as you know, pus is caused by the presence of neutrophils. So basically, these patients have a lot of abscesses that do not have pus in them. And one classic presentation of leukocyte adhesion deficiency is going to be delayed separation of the umbilical cord in the infant. And that's because separation of the umbilicus requires neutrophils to be around. So as you might expect, patients with this disorder are going to have very high levels of neutrophils in the bloodstream since the neutrophils are unable to exit the vasculature. All right, so these patients have a neutrophilia on laboratory values. Next, we have chidek higashi syndrome. And chidek higashi syndrome is an autosomal recessive defect in microtubular function. Now, as you know, white blood cells such as neutrophils rely 
on microtubular function in order to move and in order to engulf or dagocytose their prey. So a defect in microtubular function is going to result in a decreased ability of neutrophils to fight infection. These patients will get recurrent pyogenic infections by staph and strep. And these patients also get peripheral neuropathy as well as albinism. If you see albinism, peripheral neuropathy, and recurrent abscesses, think about chidek higashi syndrome. And the final immune deficiency state we're going to discuss is chronic granulomatous disease. And chronic granulomatous disease is caused by a lack of NADPH oxidase. Now, NADPH oxidase is a critical enzyme inside neutrophils, which is necessary for neutrophils to produce oxidizing free radicals, so things like hydrogen peroxide. And these chemicals are a critical weapon in the arsenal of neutrophils in order to fight pathogens. So if a patient lacks NADPH oxidase, they can't create as many reactive oxygen species, and they don't get this respiratory burst that occurs in neutrophils to create these free radicals to kill other pathogens. So the result is a lot of abscesses over time, in particular staph and strep. To diagnose this, you're going to check for a nitro blue tetrazoleum dye test. And normally, the nitro blue tetrazoleum dye reduction test is going to turn blue in a normal patient. And turning blue is considered a positive test. If this test does not turn blue, we call it a negative test, and that's indicative of a patient lacking NADPH oxidase and therefore having chronic granulomatous disease.